Hello, everyone. This is Trip, And today in this special conversation, part of the Christianity in Process uh, series is John Gill. And you may be saying to yourself, uh, do we normally have such handsome looking theologians uh, <laughs> <laughs> running around? I didn't know process got this cool, but he's not just a, a scholar. It's not just a process philosopher of religion. He's also an artist. Uh, it, it creates all sorts of music, uh, a, a DJ. And I just found out that you, you started doing uh, it, you, you just started a clothing line, like yes, aesthetic religion. I saw the aesthetic hat and I was like trying to click around, like, are you allowed to order these anyway? Like you <laughs> soon you will be. Yes. OK, <laughs> so so you, you're you have a, a multiplicity of talents um, that uh, if people go follow you and check you out online, they'll discover. Uh, but so who when when John Gill introduces John Gill, how do you describe yourself? Like when you meet someone for the first time, uh, knowing all the different parts and gifts and ways you express yourself, like how do you introduce John uh, to newbies? That's that's a great question. First of all, thanks for bringing me on. Trip. Really, 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 really appreciate it. It's really, really good to be here. The short answer to that question is when I when I when I first meet somebody, I just say I'm John. Like, like depending on where I am, you know, I'm just I'm this it's, it's me. But um, but when I but when I'm asked that question around what I do, I usually say, well, I'm a philosopher, theologian, artist, and connoisseur of religion, in in no particular order, you know, originating from the south side of Chicago and have lived in several places now. But yeah, um, I used to describe myself under my alias Gilead 7. I used to say, well, I'm abstract, concrete, and progressive. And this was in this is in many ways before I even encountered Whiteheadian process thought or process thought in general, but that was sort of my description. And I kind of play in between those two now, you know. So, you know, I may just say I'm John or I might just say, well, I do XYZ and and there's no real separation between the clothing stuff I do, the record store that me and Michael Adame, also known as Phantom Threat, own, um, and the stuff that I do in the academy. One is the other. Is the is, is the other. You know. Yeah. It, so so if if you think about where these categories that you work with now, um, like religion and theology and things became not just something you inherited, but right. uh, a, a a collection or a community of questions that uh, kind of seized you where you were invested in it. Like what was that origin story of the faith received to the questions that turn you into a philosopher? This is a great question. Like, and this is something that for me starts super early. You know, because I mean, I was raised charismatic Pentecostal. Um, my uncle was a pastor. I grew up in his church. Um, at one time, I wanted to be a pastor. Um, I wanted, I thought that that's something I wanted to do. But at a very early age, I ran into some brick walls, Trip. Um, and those brick walls were, well, they're telling me that I need to accept these traditions that are really heavily based on things that I can't really experience with the senses. And they were telling me that you should just accept this hook, line, iron, and sinker, and, 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 and that if you have faith, you'll have certain experiences. And I thought I did at one point, but then there was always that thing that made me just say, this don't really make any sense, you know? Um, and I must have been like four or five, I wanna say. And this is kind of after, or maybe, Maybe, well, I think after I, 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 I say, I'll say what I'm going to say in a minute, but I asked my mother the question, well, um, where did God come from? You know, if, 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 if I'm being told that, well, everything around has some sort of creator and you're contributing all and you're saying that everything that exists has to be created and that creator is God. Well, if God is a part of existence, then God needs to be created as well. Where is God's creator? And then I was just kind of I, I'm told to just I forget that. Or I may, I may have been even told just just stop, stop, just just accept it, <laughs> you know. And so and so that became a sort of issue. And then not too long after, um, my mother wasn't a philosophy major or religion major in college. She was she actually was a special education major, but she took courses in religion and philosophy. 
So as seven or eight, I'm, I'm running through a books and I'm finding like tell it's the religious situation. I'm, I'm running across the dialogues of Plato, especially Plato. That, that's what kind of caught me at an early age. I got I got to tell it later on, but she had that stuff all around. So I'm reading this and I'm like, okay, why, why, why has she kept these books? She doesn't, um, because what she's telling me is very opposite. And then not to even mention before my mother became, a, before she became a charismatic Pentecostal Christian, she also had, she also engaged in Buddhism for a while. Uh, and you know, um, my father's background was Methodist. He's my, my dad's side of the family is from Belize. My, from my mom's side is from Chicago. My, my dad's side is traditionally Methodist. Methodist Methodist Church of the Caribbean, which is what they were. My uncle was very high up in the Methodist Church in the Caribbean. Um, went to Emory, then went back to Belize, then went then went from from Belize to Honduras to several places and, and retired in Saint Kitts and Nevis. But so his background was that, and my mother's background was a traditional Baptist, in which she gave up. Then she went back to this, and then she and my father both kind of came together. They didn't meet in this Pentecostal charismatic moment, but they came together in it. So. I'm wrestling with all this shit, you know, and it's like, well, this is not really making any sense to me, but I'm told I need to accept it. And, and there's something about it that is that seems to be powerful. It seems that I feel something when I'm praying and when um, doing other things that I'm told I'm supposed to do. It seems like I'm, but it just doesn't make any sense. So at the age of 12, I get to a brick wall and I, and I just tear up a Bible in front of my mother. And I'm like, this don't make any sense at all. Like, yeah, that's dangerous. Yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, not only in the sense that that under some beliefs I would have been struck by a lightning, but in the sense that I would have got my ass whooped. I don't know if I can say those yeah, things. On yeah, okay. I okay. I know the feeling. <laughs> um, I I made a movie uh, about three or four years ago where my character rolls a joint with the passage in Leviticus that. <laughs> condemns homosexuals and he gets this youth minister to smoke it and says puff puff pass leviticus um <laughs> and i thought i was mostly thinking that this is funny and in yeah. filming it there was someone on the film crew that was so scared bad things would happen that if i actually used a if i tore an actual page out of the bible um they were like okay but could you just use when we actually tear it could you just use the table of contents <laughs> that wouldn't be as much fun like <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know so like no actual pages of the bible were harmed in the rolling right. of the joint in the road deadman um anyway <laughs> sorry for the, but like i completely get that and i didn't i didn't grow up in that space and then all of a sudden you i get the director coming over hey um yeah we're gonna need to not use an actual page of the bible <laughs> something else but not that right <laughs> i was like i'm a baptist preacher's kid i didn't know it had magical powers the word of god is jesus christ it's not anything written down by man anyway right right exactly exactly that's, that's a different theology right than someone who's like this book is the idol this book you did it at 12 Jesus. you did it at 12 i did it at 35 very different <laughs> You're you're really ahead of in all your heretical ways. <laughs> I've been a heretic for a long time before I even admitted to myself. I was like, yeah, I'm not, you know. So so yeah, I did that. And just kind of to fast forward a little bit and then to um, so I want to say like the age of 14, maybe 13. I I went to a youth camp. This is my uncle's mom. They had this. You know, they had these annual youth camps we used to go to. And I remember my cousin was preaching and he was like, you have to refuse certain things as a Christian. And something about that struck me. And I feel like at that not, I won't even say I felt like I know at that point that I started, I started to see things a bit differently. And that, and I kind of not only swallow what I was told, I felt like it was having some sort of impact on me. but that skepticism would always come back after going so far and saying, okay, well, this is good. And, you know, it seems like when I read the text from this way, I, I see certain things, but that could just be social condition. That could just be X, Y, Z. That could, so that's always, so there was always a balancing act. There was always a check and balance that came with this whole thing I thought may have been revelation. So, so to fast forward a little bit more, I go, 
I, I, I want to explore this. And so I go to an American Baptist undergrad called Judson College. Now it's just a university. It wasn't that when I was there, it was just college. So I wasn't privileged to have a university thing. <laughs> but but um, I went to Jose um, Francisco Morales, went there as well. So I knew him actually, I met him a year before that, but Jose and I were, we got really close in college. Um, yeah, but so I'm exploring this stuff and I'm studying biblical studies there. And that, of course, you know, even in a conservative framework, as you know, this allows you to kind of say, okay, well, some of the suspicions I thought about this thing are checking out because none of this shit you're saying is really literal anyway. And, and, and even those who have certain, certain conservative leanings toward the text will tell you that there were three Isaiahs. They will, they will tell you that the Genesis account is not literal, they will say these things. And so even that, it began to unlock some doors. Um, and I actually, I, I had a philosophy professor there, whose name was Brad Seaman. And Brad Seaman, um, shout out to him, he, he, he'd be like, look, in his intro class, he'd look, if your faith is strong enough, if you, everything we're reading in here shouldn't bother you, so we're going to read everything. And so, and he didn't really try to couch in, in some sort of Christian apologetic, like, okay, let, let, let's read Nietzsche. Let's read Kant, let, let, let's read Hume, let's read Feuerbach, leave it like, let's read it all. And he sort of expected many people to come out of that saying, I wasn't saying anyway. So it was just, like I said, confirming what, I, what, I, what I, was, I was already playing with. So it just pushed me toward a seminary degree because at that point I'm like, okay, well I could do the academic and I would also could preach maybe. But when I went to seminary, I said, okay, well, I'm pretty much done with this faith thing as I've been, as I've been told I should have it. And, and, I, and I was always interested in various world religions and atheism and things. I, and I was always reading about those things on along with doing what I was doing on my faith journey and in school. So when I got to seminary, I went to McCormick Theological Seminary, and this is where the process thing comes in. Um, the second, my second year there, you know, I began to get heavily into Tilling, was 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 really into that for, and I and, and I mean I still am, and people as such. Um, so there was a course my second year, my second year. It was called, um, and I and I saw it on the books for Chicago Theological Seminary because and at, at McCormick you're able to cross list with all the seminary you know it's 10 seminaries in the Hyde Park here so you know you can cross list them all so I'm like okay well McCormick don't have nothing to really grab me let me see what CTS talk about so which is where I have my first Tillich seminar so I see this course called process theism now I'll be honest I didn't know what that was and I said hmm this sounds cool. And a roommate of my I actually talk about this in the beginning of my book my roommate at the time was like is that process theology and I said, I think it's just a class where you process what you think about God. And that was that. And I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> so, so, but I took it. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know shit about it. Like <laughs> I just happened to, and the course changed my life. You know, it it changed, and I didn't know what I was doing in there. Um, I it it because we the professor just threw us right in. So, I mean, we're starting with like adventures of ideas. We're starting with process of reality. We're starting with everything like that. We read Suhaki's God Christ Church. There were, there were a few other things we read in there, but it was mostly Whitehead that we, yeah. we read. And it's just like, you know, getting thrown in there. And so I'm like, I like this. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I like this. It's the, uh, I, I do think that picking up process involves like a it's kind of like you have to do a key change in a song and you have to figure out how to get there right and uh it, it anyone once you know what key you're playing at if you're with real musicians you're just calling out the numbers you're like oh it's one four five four six four it like <laughs> uh, of how the thing works but if you're doing a key change and everyone looks like so exactly how are we doing this you know and and That's switching right. to thinking process to like switching from substance to relations and these kinds of things from being to becoming involves like a key change. And mm -hmm. I think there's so many people I've talked to that like their testimony from from walking down that process aisle of becoming is that like now nah, Willie wasn't sure what was going on. I was thinking it was really cool. Yeah. I wasn't sure. And then I was just like hanging out long enough and I was like, 
oh, we got a key change. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then like then, then you don't actually know how the words work out and how it goes but now you're actually singing in the right key so then you kind of learn how to play it and that shift is such a a powerful thing because it, um and you describe this uh, i i think beautifully in the sense that the 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 philosophical vision of what religion is, its purpose and its relationship to the world culture and god um in a process framework actually uh, ha- gives us the ability to reevaluate religion uh, and how we understood it and think through it again uh, uh, deeply. Uh, but yeah, before you get there, what was the question right. in the middle of that class? Like, do you remember the question where you go, uh, I, this is the one I'm struggling with. And all of a sudden the process theism class, you're like, I think I'm going to figure out this key change because all the answers I know right now for this question, they suck. And it's a good question. I know this question's good and I don't have the answer. So I got to yes. figure out this key change. Oh, that's, that's, that's actually great. And it's, it's funny. You just, it's funny. You thank you for setting it up that way. Cause I was just going to get there for oh. me. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like you, you just gave me the ball. Now I just have to slam dunk it or, or just kick it in the gold as my dad would do it one time. Um, like, but the question, well, I guess it was two, but I guess the biggest one was omnipotence. It was, and you know, this is of course after reading hard swords, omnipotence and other mistakes, I was still, even where I wasn't, because I think by that time I was like, you know what, Christianity is just a name for something that doesn't really mean much, but I understand it to, to hold these tenets and omnipotence is one of them. So how can I save it? And I wrote a, and I, I wrote my final paper on trying to save omnipotent and it didn't even, didn't work. It didn't work. I mean, I came out and said, I can't do it. Cause it, cause you know, it just, I mean, Art Swan is very convincing of course in this, you know, not just him, but other people as well. Um, and especially the way Griffin lays out all these arguments about the Odyssey and God power. And he, but I was like, yeah, yeah. I can't do it. And but the process answer, it made the most sense to me. On this. was there was there a particular experience or question uh, part that like raised the challenge to you um, around omnipotence? Like, regardless of yeah. whether everyone knows this, every time you talk to a philosopher or theologian, uh, they're using vocabulary and abstract reasoning to process their own self understanding. <laughs> Um, you know, and I think they are. <laughs> and when you go like, well, I had these one or two questions and omnipotence and it comes to mind, like if I told the omnipotence one, right, like we could both talk about how awesome omnipotence and other theological mistakes by heart is and, and right. what David Ray Griffin does or whatever. Um, right. it, but the, the like, when did that question become real? Like where you, you go, I can't affirm a good and omnipotently powerful deity and then still make sense of these experiences or this question? You know, it's funny because I came to the theodicy part of it kind of roundabout, but I came to it through this. And this is a really funny thing. Like I was recording a record called The Dark Room, The Abandonment of Christendom between like 03 and 05, kind of in the same period. Um, the period I'm speaking of now was a bit after that. But in the, in the recording of this record, you know, I was wrestling with questions on destiny. Okay, well, am I destined to be an MC? Why am I working so hard as if I'm destined to do this? If I'm not, it ain't gonna happen no way, so don't even worry about it. But I was in the studio one day and, and, I, and I remember this and shout out to Deftone who, who was recording me at the time. He actually, and I, and, I, and I could never get the sound I got from that record any other time, side note. So shout out to Death to Degree. But I'm I'm in I'm in the audio booth one day and I'm just, it's dark in there. And I'm just the only thing I could see is like the notepad. Cause then I wouldn't read off a cell phone because cell phones wasn't like that back then. You actually read off a notepad. If you if you if you couldn't remember, remember the rap, most times most times I couldn't. I, I I memorized after I recorded something. But anyway, I'm in that booth and something hits me. The only way you'll get this done is if you do it. Ain't no destiny, ain't no nothing going to really happen. You have to make this happen. And so a- around questions of omnipotence, well, if God is all powerful and God has, has determined certain things, I don't really have any kind of choice 
Anyway, I, I, it may seem as if I do, but I don't. So when I when that when that uh, as you said a key change, when that key change came, and I said, okay, well, this thing I've been told all my life that well things happen for reasons, and now my question is now I always ask somebody, well, 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 what is the origin of the reason, and how can you prove that? Because I wasn't I didn't formulate it like that back then, but then I'm like, okay. Well, now that I've done that, now I begin to rethink this whole thing about theodicy. And I say, okay, well, it's really hard to conceive of a God who loves, but is responsible for all this various types of what, what, what we would call evil. Yeah. So from this experience in the studio, from unlocking omnipotence that way, I begin to unlock it around questions about, okay, well, yeah. My my ancestors are from the place we now know as Africa, among other places. Mm -hmm. The way the way they got the way they got to many parts of the world in which they came to is not I can't call that providence. And if a God allowed that to happen and that God is all powerful, then we have some problems. And so that's kind of where I got to. And like hip hop, especially hip hop's ways of critiquing society also made me think about that. But the first experience with this was that, that studio experience. Then this led yeah. to that. Oh, that's, that's such a good story. And it, it, and I think that question of like destiny attached to determinism, right? Like raises uh, a host of questions when you look at history, because that's packed full. There's not just one cross that, right. That someone dies uh, unjustly. Um, and, and if it's all been determined, then uh, God's got a kill list that's, that's not going to help the ethical assessment of love. And and I think the other side of that destiny bit is how many people, especially in religious things, think of the will or purpose of God as like one thing for you, right? Like uh, what what is God's will for this? And uh, what is God's plan for me? And there's this whole anxiety Mm -hmm. um, among a, a large part of the church, especially adolescents and in college, when I was a campus minister, I heard it all the time. Like mm -hmm. I just, I'm trying to figure out what God wants for me, you know, and there's all this anxiety about trying to stay on the one path God has planned for you. And you might screw it up. If you have any freedom, don't, you don't want to screw it up. Uh, and right. it, in both of those pictures, either the fully omnipotent and complete control or the omnipotent deed who permits you to have some some freedom. But I really hope it works with my agenda. Um, <laughs> both of those kind of have this picture of providence, uh, like you were describing, of God determining everything. Um, and 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 Lord knows you don't want to get on the wrong side of it if you have you know any permitted freedom. Right. And, and I think that there's a difference uh, what's the line? And you mentioned Marjorie Sue Hockey's God Christ Church uh, that she goes, God doesn't have a plan for every person, but a purpose in every situation. That's right. And That's right. I was like, man, Marjorie, if you'd only had Twitter, you know, because <laughs> that shift from a plan, be it an omnipotent one you can't escape from or an omnipotent deity, it gives you some flex room, but you better not get off my holy will. Um, both of those imagine a, a, a world where impro like improvising uh, and, and joining the flow in zesty, adventurous ways and discovering how brokenness and failures can be uh, turned into something different by repurposing it uh, from mm -hmm. the agenda. So all those things get chucked out. Right. And it becomes like like, you know, is is my needle going over the thin grain of this the, this LP in the yes. one direction it's allowed to go? Right. Right. Yeah, I think that's great. Right. You know, and it, we just begin to really rethink this whole thing about. Pro and I, I'm glad you brought it because I think she says that at the end of God, right? That's actually a great shirt. That would be a great quote for a shirt, actually. You know, this whole notion of, re of, of repurposing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we well, have to talk to aesthetic religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me let me let me let me actually find them. Oh. I, that's me and my brother, so I can find. <laughs> so, oh, good, good. You, you, you figured it out. How quickly? <laughs> and even this whole question around um, repurposing, I think that's the reason. And I and I've told Monica this, who actually after this class would process theism, 
the next semester she was offering because she was at the Little School of Theology at Chicago at the time, which is right next to McCormick. And I wound up going to LSTC for a doctoral program after I finished at McCormick. But it was her first year at LSTC and she had a course on process theology. And so I took that and that kind of just let it, just laid, laid it all out for me. But even in this, in this first class, I, I took a Chicago Theological Seminary. When I was looking at this thing, even around notions of repurposing, I said, well, that's, I said, well, Whitehead is like hip hop because Grandmaster Cass says hip hop didn't invent anything, but it reinvented everything. And so as a person who is growing up around hip hop since I've been born, you know, seeing graffiti, seeing breakdancing, seeing DJing, seeing rapping, I always saw it as, okay, well, this is a recreation, but the recreation is, is, is a work in itself. Spray cans wasn't meant to be used to, to, to do these stylized pieces on walls. You weren't supposed to be scratching no record. You're supposed to play the record and leave it alone because just sit down. Don't, don't mess with it. You know, I mean, using your body in the ways that B-girls and B-boys do, dance don't go that way. You're combining elements from Tanzania to China in the same move. You ain't supposed to do that. Hip hop does it. Hip hop reinvents everything. So I'm like, when I was reading it, I said, this whitehead is hip hop. You know, this process thing is the same. And it was really a cool way to kind of explain the deeper things that I saw happening in something I was very involved in. Mm -hmm. you know? So, so just in that, uh, especially in think some people may have never thought about hip hop at all, short of uh, when they change the channel and others may be very into Right. But in that, it, when you use the word hip hop there, you mentioned from how one uses a record to dancing, to remix, like there are all these different elements, uh, like taking paint and then doing graffiti. Like underneath that, in a sense, you're just hip hop is a kind of aesthetic and a kind of mode uh, of engagement. Could, could you kind of uh, fill that out? Because I think that um, it, it, in some sense, when they get the bigger picture of what as a scholar thinking about the culture where hip hop emerges, uh, then the connection between process and hip hop will, you know, will get a bit more clear. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, yeah, just to even or they can go get your book on it. So <laughs> they can do that too, right? <laughs> do both, do both. I would, I would, I would certainly appreciate it. Um, but just to kind of give a, a little bit of history behind that, which is where I go on my, the first chapter of the text. Um, yeah, hip hop starts in historically from many trajectories and their various ones. They're competing histories about hip hop, like anything. Okay, well, let's start here. So that many people, I would even argue to say most people would say that it began in the Bronx in the, in the early 70s. And the elements of the culture are graffiti, which is the first element, um, which actually starts in the late 60s in the, in the ways that we know it um, from the graffiti artist Cornbread um, and then becomes popularized in New York by um, the time, by the Time Magazine article on the graffiti artist Tacky183, who was famous for writing his name all around the city, then Julio137, other people such as this. Um, then there's DJing, which DJing in hip hop is not just playing a record, it is invented by Cool Herc, um, legendary Cool Herc. Um, and this is a very important thing to hip hop in its beginnings is the byproduct of several individuals from the Caribbean, whether it's Jamaica, Puerto Rico, whether it's Cuba, whether it's um, Trinidad, whether it's Barbados, um, and the creation of Afro-diasporic US individuals. Um, several other people who were, in, who were in the Bronx are the origins of hip hop. In Jamaica, Cool Herc comes to New York from Jamaica at about the age of 13. This is right around the time when reggae is popping. When, when in Jamaica, um, they're, they're DJs who were known for how loud they could play their systems. And not only that, they were also known for the records they had that no one else had called the dub plates. 
So um, there was a tradition of, of talking over records, of talking over instrumentals that happened in um, Jamaica that Cool Herc was very familiar with. To go back to breakdancing, now many b-girling and b-boying as it's, as it's traditionally known were dances that people did to these parts of the record called the breaks, you know, those drum parts that are really addictive. So Cool Herc was like, well, this is interesting. People come to the dance floor for those, well, the b-girls and b-boys who were, who were doing this type of dancing, this acrobatic, these displays of this like envelope pushing, breaking point creativity are coming to the to dance when those breaks are on, but they leave when they off. So how, how do we extend that part? So what Cool Herc ingeniously does is he gets two record players and he gets two of the same record and plays that break continuously using a mixer to go between records. So in rap music, or not only in rap music, but in, in, in several types of like, 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 like uh, music, the, the loop is very important. And the loop comes, it doesn't matter what the record is. It doesn't matter if it's a country record, if it's a hip hop record, who what did it? Well, at that time, there, there was no hip hop records to be played. But if, there, if, it, if it was a jazz record, a record from Spain, wherever it was from, if it had, had a good break, you throw it in there, you have two of them and you play it. Then other people kind of, um, created and, and, and perfected what Cool Herc came up with. So at this point, there was no rapping. There was just DJs who would go to parties and do this thing that Cool Herc came up with. Now, rapping came about because the DJs would hype up the B-girls and B-boys. But after a while, um, Cool Herc wanted to focus on DJing. And, and, uh, and other DJs like Africa Bambada, Grandmaster Flash, who actually invented most of the, many of the technologies that we have on mixers today, like queuing up records, Grandmaster Flash came up, I'm up with that. So you, you, you have all that going on. Then you have people who specialized in rapping or hyping up the crowd, which became this writing lyrics thing. And in which if we go on fat back, the rapper's delight. And then this is kind of when rap music to some people becomes synonymous with hip hop. But, but um, these four elements are graffiti, DJing, breakdancing, and seeing. And also the fifth, the fifth element that Africa Bambada, who starts as Zulu Nation in the mid seventies, comes up with, well, knowledge and understanding. Well, how does one understand oneself? And how does one know where one is going? So all of those things, when I say hip hop, I'm talking about a culture that revolves around those elements, not just rap music. And so, you know, even that line, right, of the sources that went into the formation of hip hop, none of them, they're, they're all received. And then the, the what's generated is something like new and different. That's right. And I, and I think that that is uh, really helpful. One, right, like, obviously, that has to be the case uh, it, in the sense that it wasn't a musical genre that existed before. Um, the kind of dance and things oh, these it, it is weaving together and bringing in these things and repurposing it and reworking it in, in, in creative ways and then building a community out of the uh, the aesthetic that's there right and I'm not surprised that a process scholar thinks like the story of hip hop is actually helpful to think about the stories of different religions right and um it. and it's not if you haven't and if you've read uh, religion in the making uh, Alfred North Whitehead's book, think about it. It's not surprising either. So thinking of that picture of the emergence of hip hop and how it receives and repurposes in, in, in this aesthetic. Um, how has your understanding of religion shifted and how, how is it connected from the, this uh, situation where, you know, you, your parents are bringing their religious history and, and stuff together. You find a charismatic uh, congregation as life giving and things. You got your mom's library over there with this Plato sneaking out on the corners. You got these questions and things it, you tore up a Bible, but we don't have to tell anyone um, <laughs> in this kind of thing. But the, when when you think of the, the vibrancy of hip hop as a culture that inherits precisely through the repurposing of different traditions and inheritance. And then think about the religious task in a process framework. Like what are, how do you see those connections and how did it help you think about your own religious inheritance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That that's a rich question. Like, and I I, I got to start with my dad on this one because while my mother had when she became a charismatic Pentecostal, while she had a sort of esoteric view, she was really really into spiritual warfare. If you ask my mother what particular demon did such did such and how to pray against him, she no. Like like that's my mom. Like she was really heavily into that. My dad while engaged in that was more of a practical individual when it came to because he would say okay well the miracle here john is that someone the miracle is not somebody potentially being healed the miracle for him was okay well, well somebody you used to you used to do xyz now they don't and he even tells me now and he's like well you know you, you you can say what you want to about religion and he knows that i do we had these long discussions about it but he'll but, but, but he'll say you you can say what you want about that but you have to admit that there is something about certain types of belief that causes a different a, a difference of life in the world and i'm like i got to give you that in some instances sometimes it's for better for sometimes it's for worse but i but i bring him up to kind of go into this this whole notion of hip hop as a religion and how and then how looking at it as a woman, look at the war religion comes into play with him. Um, Cause he would always say, I remember when he would coach, I, used, I would be with him like every Tuesday and Thursday when he was coaching soccer. He, he had a team, several teams, he was really good. And people knew he was a Christian. They knew he was a charismatic Pentecostal Christian. They knew that, but he was never beating them over the head with, 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 with the proselytizing element of that, that some say he was supposed to have. And he, and, but people would ask him when they were having issues, but what is it about you that's sticking out? And he would always tell me, demonstrate a life. You know how I have to say nothing, just demonstrate a life. And, and, and the ease that he interacted with people who were not Christians, some of the most of the most of them, well not most, but many, many, many of the team were uh, Rastafarians. Um, some were atheists and they were a few who, who were who believed like he did but most but the ease in which i saw him flow into situations it wasn't like my mother who in many ways would try and separate herself from non-believers and she would criticize him for the why are you always around those unsaved people she may say things like, like that from time to time but him so this whole secular religion thing that i kind of picked up in with hip-hop it started with my dad and looking at, at his natural interpretation of his faith so to go to go forward to hip-hop when i begin to think about how hip-hop combines several things and makes ways of life to create meaning for people because i mean i believe that the elements of hip-hop which are these recreations are these repurposing as you were saying they create ways of life for people and this is more important to someone than many other things in the world so when I look at that and, and just referencing the way my dad understood his faith, his faith wasn't one that was really super rational. It was very, it was, it was very in the world. And when I look at hip hop as being that which is in the world, which gives meaning, but giving meaning by reverencing several other things and not partitioning, you know, that I said, well, when I when I when I look at hip hop, how is that how is it any different from Islam, from Judaism, from Hinduism, from any other type of world religion we talk about? How is that different? Now I now I know they are because I, I, because of course no religion is the same, but there's something similar going on, I think, and that's kind of yeah. so so I mean that that's kind of what I pull from. So the so in some sense it depends on the kind of question you bring to go. How are they the same? So. If you're asking how does a community generate a culture that wrestles with meaning, purpose, value, uh, and and come up with ways of symbolically communicating and giving uh, uh, rituals and stories, things you can participate in to think about and frame life around big questions, like then in some ways, hip hop as a culture does the kind of things we used to just use the word religion on. Um, and it, it, and one of the things that strikes me, and I haven't. I haven't read your new book, but with you, that uh, just came out last month um, about uh, it, it, it's called it was what's it called toward Afro diaspora and Afro futurist philosophies of religion. It's a long title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but the, the, one of the things that struck me doing that, having um, uh, spent the last two years uh, uh, leading the decolonizing the philosophy of religion 
uh, here at the University of Edinburgh for the philosophy of religion classes uh, nice. is that most people think when you use the word religion, it doesn't have a lot of baggage and it's a clear you know, right. And then you right. go to a philosophy class and you and you go like, we have a whole class that's just answering what is religion. <laughs> and then you realize there's like 40 different definitions and, and you read each one and you're like, that is good. That's accurate. Then you read another one. That's the opposite. And you're like, but that's good too. And, uh, and then you find out the history of all these scholars and you realize, Oh, junk. They were talking about white Western religion. Right. Yes. And they're, and and then if you shove all the different religious traditions in whatever philosophers category of religion in the West, you, you may not even be looking at the parts the actual practitioners of those traditions think are the important parts. You may think their ideas are really important. And if you ask them, they're like, do you believe this? They're like, yeah. And it's like <laughs> and they don't mean it like a Protestant, like, right. you know, Protestants, we, sh we killed people over interpretations of the Trinity and how Christ was present at the Eucharist. So, you right. know, the answers on belief questions, real important for our tribe, uh, for That's white right. Protestants, they do it right. You know, they, 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 <laughs> they then they're like everyone else. They may not, but we're going to force <laughs> them into our categories. And so like, once yes. you start to connect those dots, then in some sense, you, you realize human beings have been gathering around campfires forever asking these big questions. Yes. And then uh, recently in uh, the legacy of colonialism has become clear that we would meet cultures and then shove them through the meat grinder of what we call religion. That's right. And and then decide, well, what parts are good? We could probably co-op that. And then what parts are bad? We're going to call it pagan and uh shame people make sure they're in the closet if they engage in any of these parts of say african traditional religion or, or these kinds of things thinking about w just guessing what's in in the book so like to to me that description you gave of religion and how it's connected to hip-hop if someone's uncomfortable when they make that connection that's one of those moments just to take a deep breath right and then say unlike just a reductionist materialist that's relativizing your religion process is it here's right. the process vision right is it the very source of all things that's present in all becoming wants right. to invite every creature into meaning purpose value adventure zest beauty goodness love and all these things mm -hmm. and is going to use whatever cultural apparatus ways of community building and will even repurpose uh the slave master's religion yeah and there were when people joined this class, I asked them questions and thinking of your, your, your book and what you shared, there were a couple of them that that were uh, uh, that said, how, how, how does process help me understand uh, my growing awareness of the way the church cut me off from my heritage uh, through like it's just just the whole process from 1619 on right mm -hmm. like cut me off from my people in africa from the traditions and things that are there um mm -hmm. that how does process help me think differently about re-engaging that and negotiate uh you know, preserving the liberationist strand of slaveholder religion there are a number of questions that had those themes in it and so I'd love for you to take whatever time you need to help take that process vision uh, of religion. And how does it help us negotiate those kind of questions in particular for uh, a, a number of the African-Americans that are wrestling with it? They're in the class. I I'm not really the person to give the answer to that question. So uh, I'd love for you to kind of unpack it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's that's actually super, super important. I, I think that Monica's work is so great in making the way out of no way. Uh, Monica A. Coleman's work. Is so good because um, in the and not just not, not not just this text, but I mean in several in, in several texts. But um, this emphasis that she gives on, well, if the past is the present, then that's not gone anywhere. That that's not that's not gone anywhere. What what I think process helps us do is to realize it's not gone. And okay, well, when we when we practice a certain thing or when we make food a certain way when we 
give reverence to God in this particular way, how much of that is from the areas we now know is Ghana or Nigeria or Senegal or Morocco or Angola, or you know, how much of that is there? And and I think this that this causes us to look at them in, in those ways. You know, okay, well, this is this is what this is. Um, now I think um this 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 question around repurposing um is a very very interesting one um and in, in, in terms of because one may say okay well this has no benefit for us because it is xyz now um and this is an interesting point because I, I do talk a lot about well how is a person's faith decolonized and how does that happen um but we can't forget that what we're talking about is from the north it's from north africa and, and the, the middle east anyway so, so that's, a, that's very, very important as well, the work of Agbu Kalu and other scholars who talk about, well, the history of Christianity and the continent. You know, um, much of the history itself is not necessarily the product of colonization. It is in some ways, but in some ways it's not because sometimes we think, okay, well, people were captured and they had different languages, they had different religious traditions, et cetera, and they were captured, they, they were all made to be this one thing, Negro, Negro, Black, et cetera. They were all made as one thing. Um, and sometimes we think that they all got to Christianity via, via conversion, but some of them were, were Christians already. And some would argue that well, well, many were Christians for thousands of years. So it's also that it's it's really, I think, I think let's go back to the history of Christianity. And now while many of us did learn the slave masters Christianity. The origins of Christianity come from places that we populated. So I think that's one thing as well to remember. But this, this, this question of being subversive is, I, that, I mean, I think this in itself is hip hop, you know, um, because in the, in the text, we talked about several things. My goal was never to cut them off from the work that happened in Germany, France, et cetera. So, I mean, we, we stay close to James Ellenberger's text on philosophy of religion while reading several other things that many would call classic philosophy of religion um, from Hegel to Tell, Schilling to Schelling to Tellick, et cetera. Just the list goes on back and forth and in no particular order, um, Spinoza, Hume, um, et cetera. But how do we do that work? without centering any of them, you know? Is Afrofuturism the canal, as you mentioned? Is Afrofuturism the canal that decentralizes everything, which gives privilege to everything? And so, and so that to me was very important. Um, and some students, they didn't use any of that when they, when they talked about Erica Badu or Janelle Monet in the text of Young Thug or, um, or Jane, or, 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 or a critiques of James, respectful critiques of James Cone's work in relation to trans bodies. Um, they may not, not have used any of those traditions, but that's the very point. You don't have to, because you don't need them to do philosophy of religion. Dance is philosophy of religion. It's really a repurposing whatever you want this to be, whatever, what, however you figure out what religious belief means that is not the name that this was given but we can use it for such if that makes sense yeah no i it, it, and i love that point that in the task of kind of reclaiming repurposing and all that it, it all that work it, it when you think process the past is always coming in every moment anyway right and so part of the problem is uh that that what we're attending to what we're conscious of uh, it involves a cutoff, a cutoff from uh, things, but it's not like they're not there. And so w one of the liberating tasks is actually attuning and attending to uh, so much that's coming in uh, in any moment that when you've internalized the hermeneutics of a domination system, then you've learned to mute things. Right. Um, like I think the ecological crisis in part is a good example of how we've muted uh, nature, we've made it lifeless, uh, and and it's seen as resources for an economic system, and that that it what else is it muted? 
uh, it's turned humans into human resources, and we've seen the effects of it, right? And so it's it's not just something that plays out uh, in trying to think about the way that cutoff has happened from the That's traditions right. of uh, of the past. But the the other thing about it all, the, you know, the past all being present, I think that helps people <laughs> processing their religious identity um, is you and I, uh, you and I are not in the religious space we grew up in. Right. But the encounter with the divine we had there as intimately animated where we are now. And I think one of the greatest gifts of process vision gives is a recognition that God, the divine is always invested in us where we are uh, calling us. And that means Regardless of the ugliness of that situation or the frustrations or the kind of questions we may not have been allowed to ask and turn into heretics or all, all that kind of stuff. That doesn't mean that in the past, that is in every present, that the presence of divine love wasn't always, always there and at work. And I think a lot of times when people think the conclusion of any tradition, any religion is a set of ideas then they go, well, if I don't believe this or this or that, or I need to get to the right version of this or this or that, then they ignore that through that whole story, the divine's always been present. And the beautiful things that happened and, you know, at youth retreats where the sermons were subpar theologically or <laughs> yeah. uh, the, like God was present in those. And it's the same God that's present in the next moment of becoming it, it, in the same way, that's the same God that was present the first time you were at a live show and you got caught up in the energy of the of the musicians. And you realized that all of a sudden you were humming at the space they're humming and you realize that you were being affirmed because they were giving words and space and movement to the things you weren't sure you were letting out. And you were like, oh, things just got honest. But when am I allowed to do that? Because that's secular. Like, there's so right. many ways when we think of all of the past coming into each moment, it actually gives us a vision where uh, so we can learn to trust the presence of the experience of God without identifying how it expressed itself as absolute and final. That's powerful. I mean, it kind of reminds me of some, sometime I tell my students, you know, Look at look at religions, whatever you call them, it's kind of data. It's, it's kind of like elements of data, datum, as Whitehead might say. You know, they you know burst of energy. I make the data of Jesus, the cross, the text, the prophets. I may take those and do something different with them now that my mother doesn't do, but I'm still pulling from the same data. And I'm, and I'm still doing the, and I and I and I'm still communicating with that data because one of my friends because I don't even identify as a Christian anymore I just identify as me but appreciation I, I didn't think it was anything weird but I have this appreciation for good hip hop because there were some bangers out there it wasn't many of them but the ones that were were just amazing and I posted one on Facebook one time this is actually a CGU, so I'm gonna say who it was. You actually might know who I ain't gonna tell you who it was. I'll tell you offline. But like, but um, and this person said, um, when I when I when I when I posted this song, this person said, Oh, I didn't, oh, I I I didn't think you were into that. I I, I didn't think you even believed in that. And, and my response was it's good music. It's very, it's it's amazing, it's it's an amazing record. I don't care what the beliefs around that are. I mean, I'm still a sixpence, none the richer, but I have this beautiful mess up on my thing right now. I can see it right now. Like I have the reissued vinyl of it. That's one of my favorite records of all time. Um, and theologically what they were doing wasn't, well, that's even a whole other issue because what they were doing theologically is a very, is a very complex thing. But, it, but even though I may not necessarily be where they were, even now it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it, it does something to me. So yeah. I think that I want, even in saying this, and this is also very important too, I think Whitehead's notion of God allows us to have space to where it doesn't have to be the same thing. Because I wanted a type of philosophy of religion that would take seriously my mom's experience as a charismatic Pentecostal and my own experience with the idea of God as simply poetry. I think Whitehead allows us to interact and to relate and to 
contrast to even use the benches of ideas, you know, to contrast. And that contrast is what's beautiful, not the, um, because, because harmony comes through contrast. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one of the reasons I was uh, like excited, uh, you, you said yes to doing this is I, I think there are plenty of people who have really good reasons uh, to check out or to leave the church building. Um, now, trips trip doesn't I I'm like uh, I, my wife thinks I'm awkwardly comfortably Christian. Mm-hmm. And uh, so like uh, we have these conversations regularly at home. But I know that there there are plenty of stories where the conclusion shouldn't be. I swallow whatever trauma, pain, questions, frustrations, and doubts I have and just mm-hmm. stay in the team I was born into, right? And one of the gifts of the, I think, a process theological vision uh, is that, yeah, we could list off process theologians in every one of the big world religions, right. and and we we know them. And they give beautiful mm-hmm. expressions. And then we can think about the way in which you've thought uh, creatively about hip hop culture, uh, doing and performing the kinds of tasks that um, if, if you use a kind of process relational framework, you could call it uh, religious. Um, and and, and yes, it, it just to be clear, because everyone should go get the book, but by it be, being religious doesn't mean you just listen to it. It's the entire culture. Uh, it, it, where it functions like you aren't a Christian right. because you have an app that gives you a Bible verse every day to remind <laughs> you of the promises of God as you go to be a faithful steward of capitalism. Anyway, right. so, but <laughs> the, one of the gifts I think of a process vision is one where uh, the ultimate mystery is present cares invested in acting and in working in the world. And it's ultimately not partisan in a way where God's dividing up cultures, <laughs> but God has always invested in working with them for That's beautiful right. things. And so for some people, that means I've given myself as a theologian of the church to it, it invest in it, to bring the most beautiful expression of the church to life and others. That's not their task. And right. yet we have these deep shared resonance because of the process vision. I would really like to just invite you to talk to people who are wrestling with leaving the building or not. And this kind of thing, like what, what has the process vision of religion, spirituality and such given you for right. Honoring your mother mm-hmm. and uh, honoring the life you've experienced, say in the hip hop community and in the lives of students uh, that you, you you engage uh, from multiple and non and multiple religious traditions and non. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's great. I, I'll even start with the student because as you were talking, even even before you got to what you just said, like when you when you when you were built when you were building it up, like the student what kind of what came up, you know, because I I've had several students who in courses in the philosophy of religion or religious studies or even enter the philosophy, they are practitioners of their faith in very devout ways. And I will take them to the limit, you know, and some of them may ask me, are you trying to get me to leave my faith? I, and, 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 I, and I say, no, I say, not at all, not at all. You know, all I'm, all I'm doing is thinking through this with you. And there's some, there, there, there are points of resonance, points of distance that you have with your own tradition. And my goal is not to tell you you to leave anything. You know, um, my goal is to help you, maybe in some small way, think about how you can practice that better. There were several there. I mean, I've had clergy leaders in my classes from from different faiths, and and this has been my response to them. How can I help you do what you do better? You know, um, just because I've made a decision to leave my tradition by name, that might not be yours, number one. And number two, in the, in the same way that Catherine Keller says, theopoetics is supplemental to theology, I would say I in some ways am supplemental, not just me, but people like me, I am supplemental to Christian theology, especially the, the kind that I grew up in, because I'm not, I'm not your enemy, I'm your ally. 
you know, even though I, even though you, you may not see me there every Sunday and you, and you, and you know, I'm, but I'm in this with you because there's something deep that we all experience. And I mean, I think that's really, really important. So I would tell anyone listening to this, think through and not just think because sometimes we put too much emphasis on thinking because I even told my, my intro to philosophy class this semester, why does philosophy always have to be about thinking? Why can't we start at this at this place of bodily, soulish energy that sometimes we can't describe, but we feel? Let's start there. And, 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 and I think many of us will say that we feel that, and that brings us into some sort of connection. And that transcends these boundaries that we call religious borders. I would tell anyone listening, um, you don't, you don't have to leave your tradition. It, it might be better if you don't, you know. Um, but yes, it's this is this is I encourage people to be open. And and sometimes that is that does that will not lead you to leave. It will lead you to, to perfect or to engage more with what you're doing to see how it could be done better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you shared that, it made me think of the first time I taught philosophy of religion in Los Angeles community mm -hmm. college level uh when i was uh abd this wonderful liminal space of uh, <laughs> graduate school this is between comprehensive exams and dissertation if people okay. don't know uh the, and and I, I we were talking about process philosophy of religion and and questions of religious pluralism someone wrote in their uh essay picked the, this for their essay and gave the example which i thought was so good and at some point if i ever write about this i'm just gonna steal it because and i told him i'm like you get an a and i promise i'm gonna steal this uh she said that uh uh you know some people see their religious tradition like laker fans where they know they love they love the nba because they really love the lakers but they actually love the nba they want it to be really good but honestly they really just want the lakers to win right and part of their identity is hating the celtics but the good Laker fans don't like hate them like they want to hit them. They just hate them because they just think they should just be awesome all the time. And their whole framework is built around the Lakers. And then there are other people who are fans of um, like particular uh, styles of basketball. And they get into that. Right. And so then when one, they might be interested in how a coach does it, like the Dan Tony method. And I'm sorry if people don't like the NBA, uh, <laughs> there's a couple of these references coming. And so he has a particular <laughs> type of offense and it's been expressed multiple ways. And they like the Dan Tony system when, um, you know, James Harden is running point, but he is in shape and cares, which is a right. completely different version of James Harden and Dan Tony system. Um, and maybe they like when Steve Nash before he hurt himself. Anyway, so mm -hmm. in other Others like really love particular players. Just so their attachment isn't so much to a team or a style, but a player. So they love like say LeBron James. And so they jerseys and they got all LeBron James jerseys at different places. And they took his, took his, took his talents to South beach. And he went back to Cleveland. And they're like, that's great. And I'm glad he's in Los Angeles and may he win another NBA championship and the Celtics lose. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so it, and, and in her essay, she was going through like it, it. No one, no one, in like if you're hanging out with your NBA fans, no one gets mad at you if they know that Trip is a Laker fan obnoxiously. Right. And I <laughs> am sitting here in, in the NBA Finals deciding whether or not I would prefer mouthpiece Steph Curry chewing that thing after he hits a three from when he crosses half court to win, mm -hmm. or the Celtics. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? It's horrible. Right. And I'm watching every game <laughs> because I love it, you know, yes. and, and others. They, anyway, so I, I give that example because like, depending on even how you, how you experience your religious identity, the part that clings to you and defines you is different. Right. And, and um, it, and I just loved the, it was a wonderful student essay. Uh, I mean, yes, she did use me as the uh, fundamentalist Laker fan in the essay, which <laughs> I appreciate. I keep all my tribal identities, I hope, uh, to sports. Yeah. But, uh, you know, some people experience Christianity that way. So then what are you doing? I'm like, as a fundamentalist Laker style, like I'm not leaving. I like want them to figure out how to trade Westbrook and get a little younger with wings on the ends who can hit hit three pointers. 
Yeah. Like, this is all my interest. <laughs> and others are like, why are you doing, you know, and, right. and others follow the style and others follow their, the player that they really connect with. And um, for so often, I think we've been told religion functions. Like you have your team and you ride or die. Mm -hmm. And uh, while they may not always win, you know, they should, but you really know the other teams are wrong. And the right. process vision like has a way of appreciating aesthetically, right? Styles, a the attachments to particular players and their own growth and development and, and teams and such. Anyway, mm -hmm. that, I, that was one of my favorite uh, undergrad essays that I, I read. And I was like, <laughs> that's I amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's super dope. I mean, this is not other teams that makes me think about battling. Because I mean, in hip hop and every element of hip hop, there's battles. Even like the language sometimes we use for groups, we call them crews sometimes. I mean, it's this military language of sorts. You know, it's it's like, okay, you have your setup and another, another individual and other collective has their setup and there may be, you know, competitions, but nobody hates each other. I can't really think of any battles I've been in where I hated the person I was battling. No, nah. I might have a lot of respect for them. And, that, and this is the reason why I wanted to battle them. You know, like, like this is, and, and at the end it's, it's peace. You know, I mean, we maintain our own individual identities, yet we're a multiplicity and yet we interact. And yet, and yet there is no, there is no problem in the, in the way, like, like, like an outsider looking in might say, oh, they hate you. No, it ain't that. Not at all. Not, not at all. You know, this shot, it, it makes you better when you, and yeah, there's no issues. It's just, this is the way it works. And yeah. You know, you have your own squad, but also those squads interact with other squads and squads sometimes trade members. And, then, <laughs> you know, it's just one of the other questions that that came in that I, I'm kind of fascinated as to what you would uh, uh, what you do with it. But the there's been at Homebrew Christianity, we've done two different of our big online reading groups around black theology and such like one was kind of a very intro so like you hinted earlier right like a, a lot of christians are don't recognize it like most of the big theologians early on were actually from north africa right they said right um right like augustine not an anglo theologian no no um, <laughs> the but so one had a lot of kind of the intro to the history a black theology in America in African traditional religion, that kind of stuff. And the other was like specifically on James Cone and his legacy and the way it played out. Okay. Um, and in that one, we had one session because people were questioned it about the, uh, the relationship of process thought and black theology. Um, and in particular, the tension that usually comes up is around God's power. Uh, what power is needed for liberation? Like, why is that question important? Then I'll ask the next one. But like, how, where's that tension? Where's that tension exist when Christian theologians are thinking process liberation and the context of black theology in America? Like, mm -hmm. Can you share about that tension? Then I have the, <laughs> the question. Yeah. I would have explained it to set up for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, this is good. This is good. Um, I think the issue with power and people play with this differently. I think Cone has his own way of playing it. Albert Clay, sometimes people forget about, um, you know, Church of the Black Madonna. Um, um, yeah, uh, but the, the, the issue is that liberation for many black theologians seems to have been necessary. It seems to have been necessary to talk about this God who was really forcefully on the side of the oppressed, not necessarily winning because in Cone, I, even there's, there's, a, there's an essay in Art to What Africa Diaspora and African Philosophy and Religion text where the, the first essay is really about, well, is there a win in Cone's work? And is there a win specifically for Afro diaspora trans bodies? But I think this notion of power is something, and this notion of, of forceful power is at least is something that's that many, many conceptualize is necessary to end oppression. And I think some would say, well, the way the process God is not forceful enough. And, but I think that said sometimes without taking into account the patriarchy of such an idea and even the patriarchy, which Cone in many ways, 
I, I wouldn't even say totally renounced, but he redacted, you know, in, in revisions of his work in later years. So I think that is because I've heard people say that, well, the process God is weak. Um, and like kind of like kind of to go to go to go on a Caputo's idea, you know, the weakness of God and, you know, the prayers and tears of Derrida, which, um, you know, it's like, oh, we, 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 we can't do nothing with that. But I personally think that that is it's a fair critique. It's a fair critique, but I think it doesn't necessarily take in, yeah, into account the dangers of this type of power, you know. This, well, type, this type of top down, as opposed to, as opposed to, as opposed to, as opposed to as a supremely relational type of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I think that uh, if if the blessed assurance um, and for listeners, I used uh, quotes, air quotes, um, if, if the blessed assurance <laughs> requires uh, God to ultimately have a uh, omnipotent trump card in order for one to be able to trust it. Right then, then it leads to that question uh, when a liberationist talks to a process theologian and goes, yeah, yeah, but but if your God doesn't have have the trump card, is it strong enough? And I think you're right. Like in, in some sense, that top down power, that picture is ultimately problematic for liberation, because what does liberation look like? Flourishing life isn't structured in ways where there's top-down univocal power. The logic of the one is not the solution to the problem of the one and the many um, in right. philosophical situations. And, and so you know, there was a, there's always been this tension in, that played out, and people can go back and check those out, uh, the, those conversations out uh, if they're interested um, from the previous classes. But there's always been that tension as to how one thinks liberation in a process context. And that was why it set up for the, the question. I would have just said a lot of what you said, probably twice as long um, to, to then ask a question is um, how does the hip hop framing uh, change the way you envision liberation? Because you shared so much early on about the way it's taking all these received things, be it dance styles, music, and all these kinds of stuff, and generating a culture that repurposes and remixes and such. Like how, how does that type of a community of remixing change how you envision liberation uh, apart from that kind of top-down power that ultimately justifies and legitimates visions of liberation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think... And this is kind of what KRS-One says in some ways about differently, but similarly to this question, because he, cause, cause he, he argues that in terms of the civil rights movement, hip hop as a culture has went the opposite way and went in the sense of movements such as the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, as opposed to civil rights tries to change the systems so that they are more equitable and have more equality. But the movements of the several movements that, 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 that happen and are happening, such as the Black Panthers, such as, such as the Young Boys Party, such as other movements are saying, look, forget, we don't care about the system. We're gonna make our own, you know? Um, and, and even in saying that, KRS says that um, the only culture in the world that has brought Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech to fruition is hip hop. So, so he makes the post-structuralist critique and says, okay, well, we don't like liberation can't depend on, on such a structure. Then he utilizes a thinker who's associated with the civil rights movement to say, well, this is, well, this post structure is the vision that this civil rights leader had. And so, and so for me, um, I think liberation is really about creating different systems and, and eventually creating systems that don't depend on that system for leisure. Because as you just brought up, you know, you can change um, 
you you can change the dominant um, force or individual, but that doesn't change the problem of dominance. It just changes the person who changes those who are in power. So because there are some people who who who, who might who might move to satisfy. Okay, well, and I and I've heard them say this. Well, you know, if people if people who look like me were on top, we should strive for that. But hip, but hip hop is saying, in my read, hip hop is saying, why would you want anybody on top? You know, if a world, and, and I forget the philosopher who who came up with this thought experiment. You 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 you, you know, um, if you could create a world without knowing where you'd be in it yeah, what yeah. kind of world would you create yeah you know john rawls john rawls right it was rawls said that yeah i mean i think that's you know john rawls a famous political philosopher where he 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 does a thought experiment then like how would you structure the world if you didn't know where you were coming in right like if you want to think about justice what are the material relations how do institutions in, uh, in society structure and relate where if you didn't know where you came in you'd be like check right and and that is a way of forcing you to get honest about uh, the places of of uh privilege that that are unexamined it's a way of getting honest about how uh, powerful structures uh work to your well-being but you want to treat domination system as if it's natural that's right and that it's that naturalizing of domination i think that that you were really pointing out and i when you were talking about you could switch to dominator but you don't switch to domination um i think for process thinkers a lot of our critiques around power aren't so much here's the answer to putting the right thing in place as much as going so often we look at situations of injustice and we we want to say, hey, the problem is not something. It's actually the dynamics of the relationships. Domination exists in toxic relationships. It perverts people's lives and their relation, their, their web of life in all sorts of ways. And the temptation of a domination system and to keep itself alive, what it does is it goes, here's the problem. And it points at some person, some group. And then goes, these are the problem or he's the problem. Go fix that. And then what do you do is you see a problem. If the problem is a substance, you think I cut it out or I overthrow it or I get rid of it. And then what do you do? You've actually left the energy of that relational network that right. is domination alive. Yep. And and I think you're so right. That's why one of the reasons I loved I, I loved your first book is like it, it describes hip hop culture in a way that goes, what would it be like if we create in a way that doesn't reproduce when we create the domination system uh, that's present? Right. And you would think um, now if this was a revival, you I would ask <laughs> the organ to start, but you would think. <laughs> That right, like, yes. <laughs> uh, that, that let's imagine you were a homeless first century Jew that died cross dead, staring down an empire, but went straight into their heart in the middle of a festival, let's say Passover, that talked about God picking sides with the oppressed. And then, right before you went in it, you said, Let me tell you what happens when you gather this is my body, this is my blood, and it's for everyone, including right, you know, the one that betrays mm -hmm. me and the one that denies me. And when you get together, do this, right? Like, let's imagine you did something like that. You know, like yes. that whole picture is a story of, yes. of, of decentering dominating powers. And if that, if that ritual ultimately climaxes in the funding of holy wars and Christendom, that, that is a missing the point uh, that's serious. And right. I think the, when you think of those tensions that so many Christians have with like, what happened to Christianity? Um, I think it's similar. I mean, I'm much more familiar with the history of punk music and the way people go like, <laughs> oh, uh, it, you know, it's sold yeah. out. And right. I, re I remember being fans of like punk and ska bands in the 90s. And then they like had one single. And then all of a sudden your friends that liked them and you're like, yeah, um, yeah, they're too cool now. I don't like them. I'm like, actually, it's good. <laughs> and like we bought their CDs because we liked it. And now there are more people to concerts and they tour more and they'll keep making more records. This is not a negative right. thing, you know. Um, right. <laughs> right. And then slowly what happens to it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes and you go, oh, I think Sailor kind of talks about this in his book on Radiohead. You know, this uh -huh. very this very kind of same phenomenon. Like, you know, 
okay, okay, now you're pissed off because they're selling records. But what they're doing, they're bringing to an audience this whole notion of, de of destructuring power. You know, so so is that a bad thing? You know, yeah, it's. I yeah. just wish they had played Creep when I saw them in concert. You know, <laughs> I they did. I, no, they hardly ever play it. That's like, like I, it would be like, I mean, I'm a giant Cat and Crows fan and yeah. I, it really dates me. But, you know, when I first joined <laughs> BMG Music Club, it was like I got four pennies for a dollar. I remember that. Yeah, four, 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 I was four, like, I got uh, Hootie and the Blowfish, Pearl Jam, uh, Counting, <laughs> Counting Crows, Gin Blossoms. And I kind of still listen to the same albums, but it would be like going to Counting Crows concert. And they don't even play Mr. Jones. And around here, you're like, come on. Yeah. If you if you're Radiohead and then you're like, nah, we're not going to do creep. You're like, yeah, I came yeah. here to sing this with you with everyone because we <laughs> like we all had that moment in life where the most yes. honest thing we could do is turn this up loud in the car and sing with you. Can you please exactly. let us do it? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not playing that anymore. No, we're not. <laughs> now, yeah. uh, here's a single off our next CD that hasn't come out yet. You want to hear right. that right now? We were going to do creep for the encore, but we just thought you're a great audience. You want to hear a new song? <laughs> like crickets in there. People walking out like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have one more. This is a fun question. This is completely yes. unrelated to anything we said. So let's say that you are hypothetically in charge of uh, at the eschatological banquet, John. Um, yeah, the, you, God's like, look, uh, we're going to have like a, we're going to have a week of a week long music festival and wow. we, like, and, and uh, on one of the days we need, we need you curating the hip hop stage, given that the, the process God uh, has all things objectively immortal in the mind of God and can give new centers <laughs> of subjectivity at this catalogical banquet to each artist at peak performance. Uh, to perform and invite people into that, the, the, the collective trance of live music and the collective together. It's beautiful. Like, like if you get five artists that are going to, that you get to pick and, and God's like, they're all objective more. I'm going to pick their peak concert. We're going to do right. it all. That's the person that's walking out on stage. Who, right. Who could you not have performing at the eschatological banquet hip hop stage? Wow. That's an amazing that's an amazing question. Um, I would say number number one, Bahamadia, one of my Philly Philly MC. She made a record called Collage and a record called BB Queen. One of the best lyricists ever. So 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 so, 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 so with the Gangstar Foundation, Bahamadia. Um, man, now we going back. Tone Rats, like. I just that just the song the song I mentioned that I that I that I posted on my page was, was actually a Tunnel Rat song, and they never play together. Some of the greatest lyricists I've ever heard in my life. Firstly, had to have all of them because that never happens. Um, I would have to say Scaramanga, who is oh, some may not know Scaramanga. He's a he was um he is um a really really classic New York street rap. I mean, amazing MC. A lot of people like Ghostface Killer. Um, I would say he was doing what Ghostface was doing before he was doing it. Shoot, you said just five, right? I already gave you three. Just five. Right? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, if you have to throw an extra one in, that's okay. But uh, okay. It, you know, it's just part of the game. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just part of the game, right? <laughs> Juggernauts. Have to, Juggernauts is a crew. I actually had them on my podcast, All Things Coffee. And I and I I had Zane from Tunnel Rats on my my podcast as well. But yes, mm -hmm. um, the Tunnel Rat, uh, but, but um, Juggernauts, they're um, siblings, school teachers, really fantastic MCs. I mean, conceptually they're amazing. Shout out to Queen Heroin, Breeze Bruin, B Slim. Have to have them, especially doing like the Clear Blue Skies record. And um, so that's that's four and Boogie Monsters who were on Pendulum Records at one time. Um, I would say the second edition of them, the second formation of that crew, which was just two of the MCs, Vex the Vortex and Mondo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those would be my five. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm just uh, enjoying the idea that a lot of people are uh, generating a Spotify playlist off the selections <laughs> to see what happens at 
uh, when when John is hosting the eschatological <laughs> banquet. Um, the, Come on it, down. You, if, if you found it interesting when uh, with the way memes and all these kinds of things work, where they pull out these little bits of old songs or even like music that plays during dance moves of uh, uh, like on Fortnite and stuff. My oldest the other day, I come walking down the hall and I hear Wu-Tang Clan playing loudly. And, you know, and I go in the room and I'm like trying to decide, like I was like, I didn't know I hadn't known if you were old enough for really do this yet right but it's playing he goes dad do you know wu-tang clan or are they probably too cool for you i was like well well, when i was cool (laughs) (laughs) and he's like why didn't you tell me about this i was like i i wasn't sure how this was going to work i mean you know (laughs) yeah he goes oh no i found out it was some like meme thing he started listening to it on spotify and then he's like yeah i told all my friends they're really into this new band like we're all into this new band and i was like really yeah it's called wu-tang clan <laughs> i was like but they just they just came out last week i know like <laughs> yeah i was like after you after you learn them you could beat run dmc i mean they they really haven't broke yet yeah um, it's it's a real tricky to explain the whole thing but did uh, you know which 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 wu-tang song it was i'm just curious i think it was cream but but he was listening. I mean, after he found something on a meme, then he started listening to it. And uh, you know, he he enjoys artists that have uh, very explicit critiques of our economic system. And so like he, he he's like, oh, oh, that's good. I, I like yeah. that. I like that. Uh, but he nice. doesn't he doesn't personally curse, which is why I never know. And his his parents do. But he. <laughs> Um, he judges us for it, and he's like, "I don't know why you would need to use those words right now, Dad." Wow! And, and I was like, "Well, I, I was like, but I mean, you got to do something when you stub your toe. Got to do something right." <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, and sometimes, saying "man" don't cut it. Yeah, oh, don't fiddlesticks <laughs> or suck. Yes. As they as they as as they used to say all the time at me and Jose's undergrad, like that, like that just don't work. Like, I don't know. but what yeah. Wu Tang is saying does like <laughs> that does work. If you're cool listening but not singing along to the curse word parts, I was like, now we gotta tell you about Rage Against the Machine, and uh, that I. So here's a, what what how would you grade Zach at uh, like as a front man oh hi because yeah, he i feel like his ability to do both like you know all out screaming and stuff to rapping to then the energy of hosting the uh, hosting the space yeah. and i think he's probably gotten uh more libertarians to sing communist worship songs than uh, anyone <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Like I couldn't. Agree. <laughs> like he is. Oh my God, Zach is freaking amazing. Like I mean, there. You know what? Ed in rage, and then with the because because you know you know there's a there's a rumored album that he had that he did with RZA from Wu Tang that's mm-hmm. like pretty it's basically done, but it never came out. Like I mean, I'm just thinking like stuff he did with Ronnie Sides, the drum and bass guy. Um, it's like, I mean, he, yeah, I mean, the energy is very, not everyone can do that and, and, and hold on to everything. And he's really, you know, in terms of like bar for bar MC and he's, he's cold. He's cold. Like that, that one song he did with KRS and The Last Emperor on the Lyricist Lounge Volume 1 CD is called CIA. Another, mm-hmm. another, another peak of economics, you know, in capitalism. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, yeah. I mean, Zach, yeah, Zach is fantastic. I met him once. I met him once. Um, there was this event in LA. You may know it. It's called the Beat Swap Meet. Uh huh. Where it's it was it was a one time a vinyl showcase that would happen like quarterly, and they they took it on the road because they they had they they had one in Portland, one in Chicago, one in Vegas, but it was started in Chinatown in LA. And so, like mm-hmm. you, you might you wouldn't know who you might see there. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, Alchemist was there one time. 
Babu from Dallas, Planet Asia, just people who are who are like these big record diggers or people in the hip hop scene. But yeah, Zach was just walking around one day. He yeah, he had his fisherman's hat on, couldn't even really tell. And I was with my boy, he's like, isn't that Zach the dead rock? I'm like, it is. So I just walked over, I just said peace, man, just gave him a hand, just walked away. He was like, man, respect. And that was it. <laughs> That's it. Because I, 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 I could tell he, he didn't want to be bothered. He didn't, he didn't oh. like want nobody to know, to, know, to know who he was. He was just roaming around, just quiet. Those kind of things happen in Los Angeles. Tom Murillo, the guitar player, that we took uh, Cora, who at this time was turning four, to a special exhibit at one of the children's museums in L.A. for yeah. Doc McStuffins. Doc McStuffins is a PBS show about a girl that is a doctor for stuffed animals and she fixes stuffed animals. <laughs> and so nice. I'm like hanging out with Cora and, uh, and she's running around at, and there's two floors of doc McStuff and stuff. And I look over and Tom Murillo's there and I'm like, is that That's Tom Murillo? and so like, I like I'm maneuvering to make sure it really is Tom Murillo. And then, it, you know, and when he realizes, yeah, you're about the right age. <laughs> I think I think you're giving me this look because you know who I am. And I and I kind of like get close enough to him and he looks at me and does this like like Is yeah, me? I'm me. I was like <laughs> and I just like kind of walk off. And then like you know, an hour or so later when we're all leaving, he he just looked at me and said, Thanks. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, all right, this is good. <laughs> because <laughs> i could sit in there going like i have no idea what one thing i would say if i started right. talking to him i would just right. mostly want to be like I, I feel like i would turn into the that chris farley skit from the 90s where he's like hey you remember that one time when you were like killing in the name of by me eh, or or when you were like bulls on parade we're like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> like you know like, <laughs> like, i don't know what to do was like, huh? Okay, <laughs> but you, but you, you did well, obviously, because you, 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 you gave, you gave you a shout out. So you did by well. saying nothing, by saying nothing. <laughs> you know how many times he's probably been, he's like, you know, out with his kids. You know, I think that that's one of those things where you're like out with your kid, and then all of a sudden someone sees you, and in their yeah. mind they're just thinking of every cool moment that's attached to your music. Yes, <laughs> and in his mind he goes, oh no, it's another one. Right. <laughs> Well, thanks for hanging out late. Well, it's not late for you. It's not 12 30 for me. For you. <laughs> yeah, you haven't even had dinner yet. No, I'm not. I'm about to cook it right now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trip. This has been so much fun, man. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. We'll have to do it again. For sure. For sure. Definitely. All right. Definitely.